Good morning, Grace United Methodist Church. We are glad that you're here. If you wonder why, like, yeah, after the video, it's because our youth just spent a week at Somersault um, Camp, summer camp, and they had an amazing time. Lee has shared numerous um, things that the youth have shared with him, he shared with me, and hopefully later on in the summer you'll be able to hear some of those stories. That video is just a glimpse of, uh, of what they experienced this week, and they were truly blessed um, by the move of God and the power of the Holy Spirit at that camp and how it is truly transforming their lives. So we are thankful for the time the youth had this past week. Um, again, we welcome you here, and we hope that you have felt welcome here in coming into this place together to worship. Also hope that you received an order of worship on your way in. Um, a few things I would like to point out to you. Um, if you are part of the nominations and lay leadership team, we're meeting immediately after worship. Um, you should already know that because we've, we've been in contact about that meeting. But we're going to meet immediately after worship right here. It will take just a few minutes of time, um, probably no more than 10 minutes. So just keep that in mind if you're part of that team. Um, this Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., our FCA 7 on 7 will be meeting here in the sanctuary for a time of worship, a time of sharing the word before um, football teams go out and they uh, scrimmage and practice and and play, but most important thing they're going to do is they're going to pray. Ain't that right, coach? They're going to pray, and they're going to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, I'm just going to throw this out there. I know sometimes it's hard to get, you know, here any point in time. At 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings, it's hard enough for some, but if you're out and about Tuesday, and you've got a little time around 9 to 9.15, you ought to swing by here and watch this place fill up. It, it is what the church universal looks like because it's full of diversity. And so I would encourage you to come by and check it out, and you will be blessed by what God does in this place on Tuesday morning. Um, also, just keep in mind, uh, Trustee Finance Church Council, we are meeting Sunday, July the 8th. Um, please keep those things in mind. Um, also, please keep in mind the, the prayer hotline changes. That prayer hotline is always on, and it's always ready to be praying for something or somebody or a situation. Uh, we have some changes there for a number and an email, so please make sure you keep that in mind. Remember, the prayer room is open every Sunday uh, for our prayer team to have special prayer with you and for you. Uh, you'll see a note about the church softball league. Cozart, we got nine people so far. Is that? Watch out. So we're, we're almost at 10, and, and you gotta ha we, we need 12 to 15 to be comfortable for our fall church league softball. Uh, it is co-ed, right? We did find that out, and so we've been trying to recruit some of our female ballers because we know they're out there. Miss Heather, she, we already got her signed up. All right, all right, all right. So we, we uh, just keep that in mind. So uh, if you're interested, contact Justin Cozart. His number's there, or Doug New. Both of their numbers are in the uh, bulletin. And one final announcement. This Thursday is uh, a bittersweet day. It's bittersweet because Miss Kathy Reese will be retiring completely. And uh, she's been here at Grace with us for a uh, little over 11 years, and she's done a fantastic, fantastic job of ministry for this church and for this community. So just want to encourage you if, you, if you have not already or if you already have, and you get a chance, uh, give her a call, drop by to see her, and just tell her how much you appreciate her and love her. Uh, Miss Denise Todd, she will be uh, taking over Kathy's responsibilities. Everyone has already told her she has big shoes to fill, so she is quite aware of that, but um, I, we believe she's going to do a great job. She will be in the office, has been in the office this month. She'll be in the office three days this week, and she will be resuming um, that, that, that part-time position fully next, uh, next Monday. So just keep those things in mind. Uh, I would ask you to stand with me this morning. Every week we do this, every week it's a reminder, and it is a good reminder because it, it, remi it reminds us of the basics, the fundamentals, the essentials, of the Christian faith, that when you call yourself a Christian, these are the very basic principles of becoming and being a Christian, and it's all about what you believe. So let us be reminded of our belief as we join together with the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let's continue standing and continue our worship this morning. Mike is not able to be with us this morning. Um, I'm going to ask Reverend MJ, I know it's impromptu, but would you come and lead us in our morning prayer? Please, ma'am. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You are such a wonderful and generous God. And we know, Lord, that you have the best interest at heart for each one of us lord you have a plan for us and we know that if we trust and obey you will show us that plan and lead us step by step in the right direction lord we thank you that you have covered this place with your holy spirit lord we know that you are not just here in our presence but you're here inside each and every person that has made you their savior Lord Jesus, we just are so thrilled to be here today. Sometimes it's so hard to get out of bed, but we know, Lord, that you even help us with that. When we wake up in the morning, we say, Thank you, Lord, for showing us another day. Lord, we are so, so thankful for this church. What a wonderful place to be. What a wonderful place to worship where we have friends that will stand behind us no matter what, no matter where we have been or what we have done. They look at us and say, hmm, you are our friend and we're going to stand by you 
because we know that the Holy Spirit has changed you in a way that nobody else, nothing else could ever change you. These people love us, and we thank you for that. Lord, now we want to praise you and pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for that. We appreciate you and all that you do. Thank you. Let's take a moment and greet those around you. Welcome them to grace.
may be seated. Church, we now have the privilege, the opportunity, the chance to give back to God a portion of what is God's with God's tithe and then our offering. And we are reminded, I hope, every week, and really I hope every day, that in our giving, the good news of Jesus Christ is being shared in this community and in this state and in this world. And I pray that we are reminded that Grace United Methodist Church, we're making a difference in the lives of people. From children all the way up to our most eldest, we are making a difference in the lives of people. And it's because of the church and not the building, but the church. Because we, the people, are the church. And thanks be to God, through the work of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us, we're making a difference. And our giving allows the ministry and the mission of this church to reach out beyond these walls, which is the purpose of the church. Let us pray together. God, I thank you that you have blessed us more than we can imagine. And God, when I say that, that doesn't mean we have everything we want. But God, we have everything that we need. God, it's you who wakes us up, as Reverend MJ has shared with us this morning. You are the one who woke us up. God, you are the one who fills our lungs with air. You are the one who causes our heart to beat. God, you are the one who provides for us the food and the clothing that we need. And knowing that you are that good, good God, that good, good Father who provides all that we need, God, we, we commit us as your, your church to you, to your purpose. We commit our giving to you, your tithe and our offering. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would bless and multiply the giving and the receiving that happens in this place today. In Jesus' name, we do pray all these things. Amen. this boat of men onto the crashing waves to step out of my comfort zone into the realm of the unknown where Jesus is and he's holding out his hand but the waves are calling out my name and they laugh at me reminding me of all the times I tried before and failed The waves that keep on telling me Time and time again Girl, you'll never win You'll never win But the voice of truth Tells me a different story The voice of truth says do not be afraid and the voice of truth says this is for my glory out of all the voices calling out to me i will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth Just a sling and a stone Surrounded by the sound of a thousand warriors Shaking in their armor Wishing they'd have had the strength to stand But the giant's calling out my name And he laughs at me Reminding me of all the times I tried before and failed the giant keeps on telling me time and time again, girl, you'll never win, you'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says do not be 
afraid And the voice of truth Says this is for my glory Out of all the voices calling out to me I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth But the stone was just the right size To put the giant on the ground and the ways it all seems so high From on top of them looking down I will soar with the wings of eagles When I stop And listen to the sound of Jesus Singing over me But the voice of truth Tells me a different story The voice of truth Says do not be afraid And the voice of truth Says this is for my glory Out of all the voices calling out to me I will choose to listen and believe I will choose to listen and believe The voice of truth And if you could please stand as we present God's tithes and our offerings. seated and children can be dismissed for children's church. Good morning. And what a beautiful morning it is. This morning I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark, New Revised Standard Version. And I will be reading from the fourth chapter, verses 35 through 41. But before I actually read the scripture that was appointed for today, I, I do want to read the first verse of Mark 4, because this kind of sets up the scripture that I'm going to read and explains why Jesus was weary um, at the time of the scripture that's appointed for today. So I'll begin with the first verse, and then I will read verses 35 through 41. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And now I'll read the appointed scripture. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you, and it doesn't happen all the time with me, but sometimes it does. A lot of times it depends on what kind of mood my dog may be in. But there have been times when I take him walking out through the woods, or if we're running down a gravel road, that a squirrel will just run across the road. And all of a sudden, that has his attention. He's not worried about walking where I want to go. He's not worried about following along with me as we jog. He's worried about the squirrel. It'll run across the road, and it just automatically, shoo, squirrel. See, the bottom line is he gets a little distracted. I think maybe many of us, if not all of us, maybe know some people like this. Not just a dog, but we understand there are people like this. And here's why I know. I would imagine you have probably been in conversation with at least someone, and it's almost as if, squirrel, because the conversation goes in a completely different direction. It's like they're mid-conversation, and a thought comes across their brain, and they never finish that conversation. They move on to something else, and you're like, what happened? Or they could be in the middle of doing something. And again, squirrel. They get distracted. The task is never completed. But let's take this idea a step further. Sadly... Many of us, if not all of us, have the same thing happen in our faith life. See, as, as individuals, as a church, as God's people, we can be tracking right along, following after Jesus. Tracking right along, having faith in Jesus for everything, and all of a sudden, something will happen in life, and it is the same mentality. Squirrel! And we become distracted. See, many times the squirrel moments, if you will, those squirrel moments in our faith happen when change occurs. They can happen when the devil will cause temptation and distraction. And let's just be honest, sometimes temptation and distraction doesn't look as ugly as we might want it to or we wish it were to look because temptation and distraction can look pretty good at times. And the devil knows that, and the devil also knows that he can cause these squirrel moments in the life of individuals as followers of Jesus and the life of the church. The devil knows he can cause these squirrel moments by presenting somewhat seemingly good things to just distract us for a little bit of time away from the mission of what Jesus has for the church. And if we're not careful as individuals and as a church, we will become so distracted on things that really have no eternal significant value and we will miss what God wants for us. And all along, it's because that squirrel came by and stole our attention and focus. But let's also get down to the root of a few other things. Sometimes it's not a squirrel. Sometimes it can be the giants. It can be the storms and the giant storms of life that take our focus off of who Jesus Christ is, takes our focus off the faithfulness and the love and the grace of Jesus, and we find our focus upon the squirrels, the giants, the storms, and the giant storms. But here's what I believe Scripture wants us to remember about our God. And this is your takeaway today. This is what I think God wants us to stay focused on in our life, in every situation that rises and that comes up. God is in the saving business. God is in the saving business. Today we're going to be reading and hearing a familiar story. It's from the book of 1 Samuel. I told you earlier in this month we're going to be tracking through the book of 1 Samuel. Today we're, we're, we're coming to an end of that journey, and we'll pick up somewhere else next week in the Gospels. But there's a familiar story. Many of you have most likely heard it. If you were brought up in church, I'm pretty sure you've heard it. If you were not brought up in church, you've probably heard about it. It's the story of David and Goliath. Before I get to what I'm going to read today, again, you probably already are familiar with this story, but before I read what's going to be on the screen, you can just leave that up there if you want to. Ben, that's cool. I'm just going to kind of 
help us remember, recap what all was going on in the life of this story that we're going to pick up in the middle of. See, there are these group of people called the Philistines, or the Philistines, however you want to say it. Group of people, they, they are not God-fearing people. In fact, they are about oppressing the Israelites. And if you will remember from a couple of weeks ago, the Israelites came to Samuel and said, we want a king like all the other nations. And God said, Samuel, they don't reject you, they rejected me. But if you will remind them what's going to happen when they get a king. Samuel did as God said, and they still said, no, we want a king so we can be like the other nations. And God said, okay, you will have a king. If you were here last week, you know what you heard, and it was a banging sermon, just to say the least. Because God chose Saul, but then Saul had turned away from God, and God then chose David because of David's heart. And so that, that gets us to where we are because King Saul, against this Philistine nation, this Philistine people, and, and their oppression of the Israelites, King Saul had failed to do what he should have done in wiping out the Philistines. The one thing he was unable to do, King Saul seemed helpless. And so in this story, there's this giant named Goliath. See, Goliath is viewed as a giant, and let's just kind of get in our mind. Oftentimes, we can maybe read this story, and we can have the, the, the image of a giant like Jack and the Beanstalk giant. That's not what we're talking about, okay? I understand we maybe have brought up on that image, but that's not the, the size and the stature. Goliath was likely 9 or 10 feet tall. Now, that's still a big dude. That's a tall drink of water, but he's still, he's considered a giant. That's Goliath. But here's one thing the Israelites should already be aware of. See, Saul, King Saul, was bigger than most of his day. In fact, Scripture said he was a head higher. And his size and his stature didn't make him very impressive neither. Remember, God's about the heart, not about the outside. So Israel should have already learned that, that your height and your stature don't really matter. Don't be over-impressed or intimidated by height. But they were. Goliath, nine, ten feet tall. Big old dude. And if you read the story, prior to what we're going to read today, the writer of this moves on from Goliath being a giant and goes directly into telling us about Goliath's armor, how heavy it was, how large it was. Goliath did indeed have a tremendous amount of armor, but I can tell you the one thing he did lack was the armor of God. See, the one thing he did lack was God's presence, God's guidance, and God's courage. He had the, the guidance and the courage of a human. He didn't have the guidance and the courage and the presence of God. No matter how big a giant you face, if they don't have God, they're already losing. And Goliath continued day after day after day to taunt the Israelites, and he would taunt them by defying the ranks of Israel. And when you read that in the story, that, that Goliath defied the ranks of Israel, not only did he defy their king and say, your king is worthless, he is in essence saying, your God is worthless too. And so day after day, Goliath is... is, is taunting the Israelites, and Goliath is completely and utterly sure of himself. But in just a moment, we're going to read something very different. See, David is utterly and completely sure of God. But because of Goliath's size, because of his armor, because of his supposedly strength, the Israelites are paralyzed by fear. It's almost like squirrel has just happened. They are paralyzed by fear. Israel had forgotten God is in the saving business. Then little David enters the scene. David was a young man at this time. Not quite old enough to be in Saul's military, though. David was sent. Here's, here's what brought David to this whole scene, just FYI. Not only was God lining it up, but God was using people to make it happen. David's father, Jesse, said, hey, boy, come here. You got your three brothers over there fighting with King Saul. 
need to take them the provisions that they need, take them the food and things they need. And so that was part of Jesse, uh, Jesse and David's deal. Jesse would send his younger son out and take them what they needed, and David would come back and give a report to his father Jesse so that he knew what was going on, not only in the midst of battle, but also in the midst of his three other sons. And so David, as he is too young to fight in battle, he's at home tending the sheep, but he's got this also additional responsibility to go and take these provisions to the military. David arrives at the camp. The battle is just getting underway. David is eager to see what's going on. In fact, he's so eager to see what's going on, he just drops off the provisions with the baggage carrier and says, Here, hold on to this. I've got to go check out what's happening. So he gets out there, and he, he, he hears, and he sees all this going, and David begins to ask a question that it seems nobody else has even thought to ask because they, they're paralyzed by this fear. They're paralyzed by this squirrel and this giant moment of what has distracted us away from focusing upon God. And David asks the question, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Did you hear me? He didn't say just God. He said of the living God. You see, David knows God is alive and God is well, and God will fight your battles if you will stand still and let God fight your battles because God will go up against any giant and storm any day, and you will win with God leading the way. So David says, this living God. See, Israel was acting like God was just irrelevant to the battle. But David... His mind, his, his heart is, if God is irrelevant in the face of battle, then all hope for Israel is lost. Furthermore, David is, he, he's completely just, it's, it's unthinkable to even consider going into battle or anything else in life without the hope of the living God. So David is not only asking, how dare Goliath do that, but he's asking, how dare you allow him to do that? How dare you allow him to mock our God and mock who we are as God's people? And then like a good, loving brother would do, he comes along David and says, Hey, chap, you need to quit meddling in our business and going back home to your sheep. That ain't the end of the story, people. That just got us set up. Let's pick up 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. And I may stop along the way up there being in chase. And if for some reason y'all get ahead of me, that's all right. We'll catch up, all right? Thank you, man. 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. David said to Saul, <laughs> here's David, this unlikely candidate. This unlikely candidate telling the king what the king should already know. This unlikely candidate telling the king what the king should have the boldness in the heart of God to do. David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy. He has been a warrior from his youth. Let me stop right there. See, what the world sees and what God sees, two different things. Oftentimes, what the world sees is what the devil wants us to think. And the devil was speaking through Saul right there, trying to discourage David. You're not able to go against this Philistine. He's just a boy. He's a little boy. He's been a warrior since... He was knee-high to a grasshopper. You're just a boy. Children, they're in children's church. Teenagers. Boys on the back row that ain't in children's church. One of them being my boy. And my other eldest on the front. Don't let somebody say you can't do something just because of your age. Don't let somebody say you can't do the work of God just because of your age that you don't have enough experience because you got the living God at work in you and he will guide you the entire way if you let him back to the story but David said to Saul 
Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion, a tiger, a bear, oh my, never mind. It, it, whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go and may the Lord be with you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. We'll see you. May God be with you because everybody else is going to watch. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put on a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi, which is a dry riverbed. He put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said, you come to me with a sword and spear and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into our hand. Mm. Church, if I don't get you fired up, you got some wet woods, all I got to say. When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David slowly walked. No, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. See, everybody else has been running away. David's running too because he knows who fights his battle. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. If you keep reading the story, you know that David went and got Goliath's sword and cut off. Goliath's head as he said that he would see David was summoned by Saul and, and we're going to kind of wrap this thing up David was summoned by Saul because Saul heard of what all that David was saying and maybe Saul's a little unaware if David's just being a little flippant or if he's being serious but at the end of the day Saul is de uh, desperate and he's like something's got to be done and I ain't doing it so he, he summoned up David Saul's initial response to David was, David, you're too young, you're inexperienced, you don't know what you're doing. But again, Saul and the Israelites have been having these squirrel moments the entire time of this battle because they keep focusing on the distractions and the giant rather than focusing on who God is. They were more focused on the giant in front of them than they were focused on the living God within them and about them, the living God who had delivered them from slavery itself. They were more focused on that junk than focused on who God is. See, God is in the saving business. Whenever time we face up a giant, whenever time we come into a storm of life, we got to remember God is in the saving business. And we got to put God first and say, God, save me because I can't save myself. And I'm going to trust in you, God, because I know you are in the saving business. You you ain't failed your people yet, and you're not going to start now. God is in the saving business. So David spoke boldly to Saul, and he told Saul all of his qualifications. He said, man, hey, I've been tending flock for a long time, and I've had to fight off lions and bears, and I've, I've delivered my sheep from those attacking animals. And David is convinced that if I go against this Philistine because of the living God, I'm going to defeat him too. But did you notice David's speech to Saul and how it progressed. See, David began telling Saul how he had delivered the lions or sheep from the lions and the bears. But it progresses. 
David said, I delivered, but Yahweh delivered me from them. See, my God, I delivered my sheep, but my God delivered me. And my God will deliver. Because God is in the saving business. And David did something significant that if you're not a word nerd like I am in the scriptures, you'll miss it. But David did something significant. He called out the name of Yahweh when he was talking to Saul. And nobody else in the story had done that at that point in time. And the name of Yahweh is a covenant name of God that God made with his people. He said, I will be faithful to you, you be faithful to me. And David is reclaiming that faith and saying, we're going to be faithful to our God because our God is faithful to us. And so Saul says, all right, may the Lord be with you. He then begins to put the armor on David. Maybe thinking that David was going to be like other kings and other nations and other warriors. But he's not. See, David refused to be like Saul. He refused to be like the other nations. He refused to be like this Philistine. Rather, David did what he knew. He picked up five smooth stones from a dry riverbed, and he trusted in his living God. Because God is in the saving business. And as David approached Goliath, Goliath taunted and bullied David, making fun of his appearance. See, David's full of faith. David's not intimidated. Philistine had a sword, had a spear, had a javelin, all you conventional weapons. David has none of these, but yet he has something greater. He has faith in the living God. He has faith that his God will deliver him, just as he has done before. He has faith that God is in the saving business. And David goes on in the midst of this conversation back and forth with Goliath. And what David is doing is not fully pat on the back for David. What David is doing is so that, so that people will know there's a God of Israel. So that people will know there is a living God. So that people will know God is in the saving business. And it seems after 47 verses of back and forth between a Goliath and the Israelites and Saul and David and Goliath and David, after 47 verses of conversation back and forth, back and forth, the battle's over almost as soon as it begins. Goliath isn't even able to make a first move. He's completely outmaneuvered. David took off running. With a sling in his stone, or a stone in his sling, and let that sling go, and that rock hit him in the head and knocked him down, graveyard dead. See, David knew he had more resources than what was apparently seen. He had the resource and the massive power of faith in a living God. And that faith in God is what gave him courage to not focus upon the squirrel of temptation. Gave him the courage to not focus on the size of this giant, on the armor of this giant. But faith and courage to focus on the God who's in the saving business. So you heard Miss June read this morning a story from the New Testament. From the Gospel of Mark, again, a story that many of us are likely familiar with. Jesus and his disciples in a boat. Jesus is snoozing quite well, asleep in the stern, maybe snoring, I don't know. Storms come up. Scriptures tell us the, the waves were, were swamping the boat. Water is seemingly going to overtake them. The winds are crazy, battering them back and forth, back and forth. And if you've ever been in a boat with waves that are crazy, you get a little glimpse of what the disciples may be going through. And the disciples wake Jesus up. Jesus, wake up. We're going to die. You don't care we're going to die? And Jesus looks at them, looks at the storm, and Jesus speaks to the storm, and he says, peace, be still. And he no more got those words out of his mouth that the wind stopped and the sea was calm. He then looks to his disciples and says, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? See, church, 
at least once a day we're tempted by the squirrels that run across our path to distract us from our focus upon God. At some point in life, we're either going to face a giant, a storm, or a giant storm. And you might be going through one right now. But let us be encouraged by God's word. That our God is in the saving business. And God don't save like other people think. Maybe God saves like a Goliath might come at you with these things for battle and we don't fight that back that way. We fight with God's love and God's grace and allowing God to fight for us. So what about you? What is a squirrel in your faith life that just distracts you from following Jesus and living out the faith that Jesus is calling you to? And I ask that question as an individual question, but maybe what if we as a church ask that question of ourselves? What are the things that keep distracting us from really being who Jesus wants us to be? See, the devil can use a variety of things to take our focus off of Jesus. Maybe the question is, what, what giant storms or giant storms are you facing in life right now? And let us remember, God did not say that we wouldn't face or go through giant storms or giant storms. But God did promise that we won't face that giant alone and we won't go through those storms alone. And somewhere in the midst of that storm, he will say, peace, be still. And somewhere in the midst of facing that giant that may be a lot larger than we could ever imagine, he will give us the courage to face it head on and overcome it. Because our God is in the saving business. So let us not allow Satan to use the squirrels, the giants, the storms, and the giant storms in our life, in the life of this church, to distract us from what really matters. See, what would happen, and this might get dangerous, but I'm going to ask the question anyway, what would happen if we as brothers and sisters in Christ, not being aggravation nations of people that could church stuff often happens, but what if we as truly brothers and sisters loving each other, that if we recognize a squirrel coming up in the life of somebody's conversation about stuff, what if we would just say lovingly and boldly, squirrel, and try to get us back on focus? Just a couple little nuggets of focus for the church. One is in your bulletin. I trust that every one of you read that thing from cover to cover at least five times before the church ever starts. Probably ten times while the sermon's going on. And I know that you can read yourself, but I want to read this to you. See, this reminds us truly what part of the mission of the church is about. It's from a young man who has been a part of this youth group not a member of this church, in fact, a member of another church. But he's been a part of this group, and he graduated this past year. Dear members of Grace Methodist Church, being a part of your church for these short few years has made me into who I am today. But he didn't stop there. Because of your youth program, I came to know Christ into my life. Because of your members, I have grown to be a better person. See, that's not just a youth group. Because of your members, I've grown to be a better person. Because of you, listen to this, because of you, I learned my calling. And because of you, I can now preach. Thank you so much for all that you have done for me and continue to do for others. And God help him that calling is to be a pastor. He begins college this fall at Southern Western University to begin the process of ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church. Church, we ought to be thankful for that. Let me share one more with you. A couple weeks ago, we did something we had never done before. 
We did a community Bible camp. If you would have shown up, you might think, well, wow, where are all the kids? What's going on here? There weren't hundreds of people there. But that don't matter. I can tell you a few things that do matter. One is that there was a little child there who he had never even heard of Bible camp or Bible school. But he heard about the love of Jesus Christ. And he got to play with other kids in the church and to see that there is a God who loves him. And later on Friday, his shop was closing down. Five boys from the community came. And they were able to eat with some awesome people and awesome children of Grace United Methodist Church. And not only were they able to eat and and have a meal, they received a a book of Bible heroes, a big book of Bible heroes, excuse me, which is a condensed version of the Bible that shares the Bible heroes, one of them being David in this story of David and Goliath. And one of the boys was so happy and excited, he said, I can't wait to get home and read this thing tonight. And they had some wore out basketballs when they came, but when they left, they had some brand new basketballs. See, church, that's what matters. That's what matters. What we do inside these walls prepares us for taking Jesus outside these walls. And if we never take Jesus outside these walls, we are wasting our time inside these walls because there's a world that needs to know there is a God and he is in the saving business. And all we need to do is call upon his name and he is there. So church, God is in the saving business. It's our mission to share God's love with this world. And let us be assured If we commit to doing that, there will be squirrels that cross our path that try to distract us. There will be giants that stand in front of us that say, you can't do this. There will be storms that come amongst you and say, I can't even get out of this thing, God, I'm going to die. And Jesus will say, peace be still. Take up your stone, take up your sling, slay that giant, and keep doing what I'm calling you to do. Church, we have a mission. Let us be on mission. Because God is in the saving business. Let us pray. Oh God, you are good. When the giant calls out our name and says, you will never, never do this. You will never defeat me. Let us be confident in the power of the living God that says we've already won the battle. We've already won the war because of our faith in the living God. And when the storms rise, and it's it's not if, but it's when, when they rise, let us call upon the name of Jesus, who is the only name that has the power to calm the seas and to stop the winds. And keep moving forward, following after you, because you, Lord God, are in the saving business. Save us and use us to share the message of your saving hope with all people. In your glorious name we do pray. Amen. You know, I look at my little girl here. Sorry, we just ran. I had to go get her. So, <laughs> but um, I look at my little girl here, and um, I look at the, uh, the faith that she has in me as a mom to, um, to lead her and to guide her, the faith she has in me to take care of her and to give her the things she needs. And, you know, it reminds me of the faith that I need to have in God <laughs> and the faith that I, um, I tend to not have sometimes. And, uh, and also, I look at her, <laughs> and I see um, how fearless she is in getting up here in front of you guys. And it reminds me of how fearless I need to be 
to do the things that God calls me to be to do and um and then this song that we're going to do now is the one that um, I learned as a little girl. It's Jesus Loves Me. And I'm sure all of you probably know this song as well. And even how simple of a song it is, it's still one of the greatest promises that we have, is that Jesus does love us. For the Bible, it tells us so. And that even us and those who are little, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. So let's stand together and let's sing this together. It's amazing how uh, these so simple songs that we learn as children can still change our lives today. There's no giants or storm that we cannot face because we have the love of Jesus leading the way. Let us, the church, go in the love of our Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And share with this world that God is in the saving business. Amen. Let us join hands together.